Welcome to Simply Robotics, the podcast, a podcast exploring the animation industry one episode at a time. I'm your host, Monique. You can find me on all social media platforms at Simply Robotics. Robotics is spelled R-O-B-O-T-I-X. When listening to the show, use the hashtag Simply Robotics Pod to join in the conversation. Again, the show is going to be usually one to two topics and animation news at a recap, unless that there's an interview or I release some of the panel audio. Our first topic, Diverse Tunes. So what is Diverse Tunes? Diverse Tunes is two animation traveling panels that highlight and emphasize the importance of diversity within the animation community. Over the summer, I got the opportunity to actually be on a Black in Animation podcast from Victoria Coker, who's the founder of Black Web Fest here in New York City. Um, she wasn't able to be the moderator anymore, so I stepped up to be the moderator, and then I had to call on some co-workers, former co-workers from Blue Sky, to be panelists. And I think that was back in July for Blurred City Con in Brooklyn. The success from that panel and the feedback from it led me and my childhood friend Jade to decide to like make this a thing and, and try to do it again and see what the turnout would be like and how we can navigate having... Uh, like I said, a traveling animation panel. It, it just seems very important to me to to really highlight, like, okay, I wanted to be an animator originally, right? I said that in the last episode. And then I had a change of heart, change of mind to be you know, um, in the production management side of things. So with the panel, it's showing you, which we hardly ever see, that there are black people, people of color, who are, are animators and have animated and worked on some of your favorite movies and TV shows. However, there's also other career opportunities where you can still work in animation without being an animator yourself, that if you feel you're not that artistic, you can still work close with artists, you can still be a part of the process. And so by having the panel, it's showcasing the different career opportunities within the industry. And also, it's so hard to network in the sense that it is a very white slash white male dominated industry, but it's also very, a lot of Asians are in this community too. So it can feel like you're a unicorn if you're black in this industry. So by having the panel and having some time after the panel's finished for networking, you can learn to meet other black people, other black women, other people of color that are in the industry, which you probably wouldn't have met any other way. It's basically the goal of the panel is just to create that exposure and to help people connect with one another. This year, since starting in July, we have done four panels. The one in Blurred City Con, we had one at SVA in September. In October, we were at City College. And in November, we did a Women of Color Multimedia with the partnering with Women in Animation. That's a national, international um, entity. And so we had four panels just in that short space of time. Going into 2019, we already have booked three panels. One is early as January, which I'll be announcing on my page, and it'll be announced on Diverse Tunes as well. So it's really picking up steam, and it feels kind of surreal every time I get feedback and people are so appreciative of having an opportunity to actually learn some of like the ins and out and hear the personal testimonies of how people got into the industry or hearing different um, backgrounds. Like I, don't, I can't give away any spoilers um, until I put out the audio, I guess. And you can hear just, like I said, the different ways people ended up getting into the industry and hearing the way that a bunch of us have navigated, be it our gender and or race, as we are moving forward in our career path. And all in all, that's Diverse Tunes, and I'm very proud of it, and I'm very grateful that Jade and I took the the leap of faith to try this thing out and make it happen. And sometimes I'm just like, well, this is really bigger already than what I could have imagined and intended for it. I'm excited for what's to come. Right now, we've just been doing things in New York. However, we are definitely working on expanding outside of New York and along the East Coast, and we're definitely working to be out in the Cali area in the late spring. So if you're a listener from that coast, you know, we would be able to link up and, and have a nice thing going on over there. But that's that's Diverse Tunes in short. The second topic was really 
sparked after a brief a freelance, you can say, opportunity I encountered at the beginning of the month. So I wanted to talk a little bit about runners, PAs, production assistants, and what that means for various studios. So in studios like Blue Sky, Cartoon Network, Pixar, and DreamWorks, production assistants are real, like, I shouldn't say real, they are production assistants. They are helping, assisting coordinators, supervisors, leads, the directors, the producers. They're like the gopher. They're doing so much of the tedious like Excel meeting note type of thing, tidying up meeting notes, uh, meeting rooms, excuse me, and really assisting in that sense. And it's a more like hands-on production assistant experience. Whereas I can only speak for New York um, the production assistant for a lot of these special effects houses is very misleading. Um, when they tell you that you're a runner or you're a production assistant, you are basically like a glorified housekeeping. And that is something that really, really irks me. I've been a runner once. I think I only lasted a month. And I was a PA, the studio PA, which was really a personal assistant, I would say, production assistant if you will to the studio slash office manager so for the first job let's just call that like studio a I was there for four weeks and originally I interviewed for to be a receptionist and then they was said that because I wanted to produce and direct it'll be better for me to be a runner that was like not a good move I should have stayed with being was it a receptionist so there were it was myself and three others that were runners for studio a we all shared a desk, which means that you didn't really have personal space. Like whoever, like there was a couple, there was like staggered shifts. So whoever got there first got to like place their stuff on the chair and their stuff on the good parts of the desk, if you will. And by the time I got in, I just had to, you know, do, do the best what I can. But I couldn't like leave stuff at work again because it was like all four of us. I'm sharing this desk with Studio A. If you were like ever seen sitting, it was definitely frowned upon because you there's always something to be done with the studio. There's always dishes that need to be loaded into dishwasher. There's always coffee that needed to be made. There's like snack containers that needed to be stocked at all times. There were groceries that you had to make sure you received and you put in the two fridge because this studio had two floors. Um, I also had to, as a runner, this was just a part of the duties. You have to go around to all of the artists' workstations and collect their dirty dishes because apparently, like, we're all grown and we can't put our own dishes in the sink and or rinse them or put them in the dishwasher. I did not like that part of the job at all because some of the artists that were there were people I actually graduated from college with. And now I'm like a maid going around picking up their dirty dishes and I just thought it was like the weirdest studio culture that like grown people, adults couldn't put walk and put their stuff in the sink. But I'm getting off tangent now. Um, the yes, constantly loading the dishwashers. That was like, again, it was two floors. So you you had to like sweep the whole first floor, like rinse the dishes. And sometimes people would leave like their breakfast. They'll leave the milk and soggy cereal or soggy oatmeal. And you had to like, you know, let that soak and then put it in the dishwasher and you always had to make sure that all the glasses were like in certain places at like certain angles. It was, it was a whole host of stuff like that. Um, like I said, I didn't stay there long at all. I think I left on a Wednesday because I had been spoken to twice. And this was like the third time I was being spoken to about using the Mr. Clean magic eraser to like scrub the bottom of the walls. And I was like, I'm not doing this. Um, I just, I kept like, they would tell me Monique, um, you got, don't forget to clean the walls. And I'd be like, yeah, okay. And I wouldn't do it. So this third time they, they brought it to my attention within like two hours or something like that. I was like, um, today's going to be my last day. You know, I really appreciate the experience, but, uh, it's, you know, and they were like, uh, don't you want to wait for the person that hired me, the recruiter to come in and just talk to her with her about your experience and stuff like that. And I, in my mind, I was like, nah, I don't need to talk to anybody. Like, this is not it. Like you also, we had to walk around and make sure that everyone's desk had a full like box of toilet tissue, not toilet tissue, just regular tissue. And if it was low to swap it out. And it was just like, so I think, so just, just it was just really too much. And I couldn't see that I spent so much of my day running around the studio just 
you know, doing all that housekeeping that I couldn't actually even engage with people unless they were in the kitchen as I was like loading the dishwasher and making coffee. And I couldn't really understand. And maybe if someone's listening, y'all can tell me like how But I couldn't see how spending eight hours doing all of that really could move me to being a coordinator in the studio. Like I'm not building any sort of relationships with anybody because um, I'm just trying not to get in trouble for like, you know, falling behind on on cereal, making the cereal containers are full or, or what have you. So I always refuse to mention that studio because they do good work. Um, I think if you're an artist and you're a producer or coordinator, it's all fine. But as a runner, I, I wouldn't say so. The second studio experience is the one that happened at the beginning of December. And I made sure in my interview, like I was asking all the questions, trying to really be clear on the fact that this job position was not going to be like what I did at Studio A. And they were very certain that it was going to have some things, but it really wasn't like that. So the first day when they were starting to give me the rundown of how they do the lunch orders and all sorts of things like that. And the way that they did lunch orders just was really didn't make any sense at all. But it was the same. It was essentially the same thing. You receive the fresh direct groceries. You put everything in the fridge. Thankfully, this was one floor. But that also meant that there was only one dishwasher and there was way too many people for one dishwasher. So dirty dishes would pile up in this sink and you didn't have gloves. So I have to touch everyone's dirty dishes in like the dirty water and load the dishwasher and the whole coffee situation. And I was just like, this seems like exactly the same issue. It's just y'all really glorified it by saying you're a production assistant and you're not. However, I would say that with Studio B, there was more opportunities to mingle because one, I had my own space. There was a really long desk um, for the receptionist area. And by being more so kind of sort of stationed to the receptionist desk and that was close to the kitchen you did get to greet people as they came in and you know the people the producers and stuff would walk by so I did feel like there was more progress or more opportunity or potential for opportunity with that than um studio a but you know I tried to I'm I'm pretty introverted despite (laughs) uh, what it sounds like and I'm not even trying to glorify being an introvert or not but when I was there, I, I made sure to to be like, when I'm in the kitchen, just say good morning to everybody. Don't be hesitant. It's not scary. It's just polite. Say hi. Smile. Because sometimes I could get so in my head that I'm not aware of maybe how that blank stare is on my face or I look like I'm, I'm checked out or in deep thought. So I just wanted to make sure that I came off as like friendly as I felt comfortable coming off as. However, they said the gig that they were ramping up for had is going in a different direction and they weren't going to need me anymore. So thankfully, I only had to do that for one day. But however, I was looking forward to making the money. I just knew that it was a short term contract. So I wasn't going to extend that opportunity. I wanted to bring this up as a point of discussion because I feel like when you are a recent college grad and and I actually got that job at Studio A just right before Blue Sky in a sense. It was probably like the same year, 2014, 2015. And I was really excited because that was my like beginning, my kind of first industry job. But then I, I just exclude that and I count Blue Sky as my first industry job. And this one freelance gig, I'm not even counting that either. I mean, I probably should because of like studio name thing. As I was saying, that regardless of whether you're a recent college grad or not, or how far removed you are from your college graduation, they studios would really, I'm speaking for New York again, try to get you by saying that being a runner or a production assistant, you have to get clarity because you really, not, if you, you want to be assisting people that you can really learn from that meet your career goals and a- ambitions and stuff like that. Like, if I wanted to start a house cleaning business, it would make sense to a certain extent being in these places, right? Because you learn what these studios need and you create a business that maybe caters to um, special effects, advertising, marketing studios, you you know, something like that. But as a person that wants to be a director and a producer, I'm never in a meeting with them. You know, when I was at Blue Sky, I was constantly in those type of meetings so I could learn how and why the directors were making some of the decisions that they were making. I could learn why producers were saying that 
they we couldn't do X, Y, and Z, or the directors couldn't do X, Y, and Z. They had to fake some angles because it would go over budget. If I'm constantly worrying about dishwashers and groceries and dirty walls and coffee, how like what is that? When can I actually sit in, in a meeting and like assist or take notes for, you know, pitches and and things like that? And I, I can't. And people would say like, oh, well, when your shift is over with the studio A, you that's when you can do those type of things. But it's like if I come in at noon and my shift doesn't end until 8, then I would have to kind of come in early. But if I come in early, then technically I'm working because I'm physically here. And it was just like not not worth it. I guess I, I want to say that if it's in your heart that you really want to try and experience this for yourself, do it. But for me, it was it was just so weird. And, and with Studio A, I had just watched The Butler and between the butler and the help, I was like, I feel so weird, you know, preparing snacks and stuff like on a tray and serving these clients who are not black, you know. And I'm like, this just doesn't feel good to me. I don't feel good picking up dirty dishes after like my former classmates and these these people I want to be my colleagues. But like seeing them give into this really weird studio culture doesn't make me feel good. I would strongly advise just don't do it. Like if you get a call in New York City again to be a production assistant, at least for special effects houses, that's all I can speak on. I would tell you to really grill them in your interview about what it is that you'll be doing because they will sugarcoat it. They would say, oh, yeah, it was a really nice place to work and this and that. But they won't tell you how many times you have to throw out bag up and change the trash can in an hour. They're not going to communicate that to you. They're not going to communicate how you have to, you know, constantly wipe down the tables in the kitchen or wipe down the counters in the kitchen or just like a whole bunch of stuff. And maybe I sound like I'm complaining a little bit, but I just think that there are other experiences, again, that I can say that better cater to what your career goals are. And I'm very adamant about when I don't feel like things are in alignment, I, that I have to move on. And I say that, too, as to part of the reason why I ended up leaving Blue Sky is because things were no longer in alignment at that moment. You know, I wouldn't say that I would never go back there because that wouldn't be true at all. But just like at that time, things just seemed like it it just couldn't like things were just out of whack. However, I'm not going to continue with that anymore. That was I'm trying to see look at my notes if I covered everything I did so that concludes our second topic for the day let's get into some animation news so um since my last episode there have been some sad things that happened Stan Lee passed away and I read this article on the Hollywood Reporter by Mike Barnes and it was a really nice article just about like the life and the journey of Stan Lee and just in short in case you don't know But I feel like everyone that would listen to this would know. But I, however, don't know that much myself. But Stan Lee, he is, was, excuse me, the legendary writer, editor, and publisher of Marvel Comics, whose fantabulous but flawed creations made him a real-life superhero to the comic book lovers everywhere. He passed away at the age of 95. In 1939, he began in the business, um, the comic business, and created or co-created if you will black panther spider-man the x-men the mighty thor iron man the fantastic four the incredible hulk daredevil and ant-man along with countless other characters so you know as i've been i am not like into comic books like i'm getting into comic books and superheroes i would say i would say yeah that's a better thing to say excuse me and um so I didn't really understand the big deal with Stan Lee it's like probably within the last year I've actually taken it upon myself to figure it out so I am um, this article again it was by Mike Barnes on the Hollywood Reporter and I would just say check it out because if you are you if you don't know as much as everybody else like like I don't um it's a good just like real like Stan Lee 101 kind of recap Uh, Since my last episode, also, Steven Hillenberg passed away 
and he was the creator of SpongeBob. There was this article on Variety about him. He passed away from ALS, which he revealed that he had been diagnosed with um, in March of 2017. He began his animation career in 1987, pursuing a degree in experimental animation at the California Institution of the Arts in Valencia and earning his Master's of Fine Arts in 1992. So the first year when he got his degree, I was not even born yet. When he got his master's, I was three years old. In 1992, he won an award for Best Animated Concept at the Ottawa International Animation Festival for his animated short, Wormholes, which went on to be shown at various international animation festivals. From 1993 to 1996, he would pursue work in television as a director and writer on Nickelodeon series Rocco's Modern Life. And Steven Hillenburg is most famous for obviously being the creator of SpongeBob SquarePants. And, you know, those were just two sad things that happened since my last episode. Also, the Lion King trailer was released. <laughs> my uh, Twitter was like in a frenzy over the Lion King being called live action versus animation. And it's animated, okay? Like they saying live action because these characters look like real animals. But to my understanding, there's no real animals in this thing. Everything is CGI. So it's an animated film. And people were just like, it's not that serious to call it animation. And it's like, actually, yeah, it is because everything is like animated. It's animation is a medium. It's not a genre. So it is what it is. This is not like the life of Pi where a lot of the animals are CGI, but the humans are, you know, real people. It's not like that. Like everything is, is pretty, it's pretty fake there. Also, let's see. There was like rumors, which I, I was trying to find out to clarify that they're reusing the storyboards from the 90s as they did with Beauty and the Beast for the Beauty and the Beast remake. Because when you see the trailer, it's shot for shot. So I, it you know, it's not hard to believe. However, I want to know if it's actually true because there was also a rumor that the artists that worked on the storyboards for the original Lion King probably would not be compensated because allegedly the storyboard artists for the original Beauty and the Beast weren't compensated for the live action remake from a few years ago. So if you know anything about that, you should definitely clarify it to me because I don't want to be lying out here. Also, I don't know, maybe you're aware, Netflix has this division, the strong black lead, which is all about also uplifting and providing opportunities for black filmmakers. And they have this segment in, of Strong Black Lead, it's on like their Facebook, it's on YouTube too, called Taking Up Space. This particular episode was about animation. So it features some animators, directors, writers, people that, black people that contributed voice actors to uh, the animation industry. And one person I was very, very happy and excited to see was Everett Downing. So Everett Downing, I would say, is the person that like really gave me my first break. He's working on a short called Book of Mojo. And if you've been following me for a couple of years, I we used to do the um, social media for for him for that. And I was like his pr production assistant slash coordinator. And I got to learn a lot from him. And I'm definitely grateful that he gave me the opportunity. He hadn't even met me at, at that time. Like, I think we worked together for almost six months before I went to CTN and got to meet up with him then. But when I saw him a part of this taking up space like animation, I was just so happy and just so grateful that uh, the light was the light has been shined on him just highlighting who he is and his contributions to the industry and just also hearing the ways that he wants to give back. So that was that was really dope. And I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to the completion of Book of Mojo. It was a great experience working on that. And you should definitely check it out. I will have the link in the show notes. The last bit of animation news I want to talk about was Into the Spider-Verse. By the time this episode comes out, I would have seen it three times, <laughs> which is a runner up to Black Panther. I saw Black Panther four times in theaters, and I think I saw it three times just in one week. <laughs> Whereas um, Into the Spider-Verse, I'm just seeing it apparently once a week. That's that's what it looks like. So with into the Spider-Verse, I was invited to an advanced screening of it because a woman that I used to work with at Blue Sky realized or, or remembered that I was very excited about seeing this film due to 
the frequency I was posting it on social media. So she was like, do you want to go? And I was like, of course I want to go. And so I got to see it. I, I got to see it the Monday before it came out. And it, I was like on cloud nine. I was so excited. I was like, this is exactly what's needed to push animation further. Like, there's we understand there's a look to like 3D movies, CG movies. There's a look. And this film, Spider-Verse, is nothing like that. And I did a movie review, which is pretty informative about the art techniques that were used in this movie. And it was just like electrifying. It was vibrant. It was it was just like heartwarming. I just so still like this was just such a great movie. Just it's such a great movie. So I hope you've seen it. I hope you read out my post about it. I think it was definitely worth the hype. It was worth the build up. There there hasn't been a Western, an American CG film like this. Like it there isn't. And I'm really happy, like I said earlier, like animation is a medium. Animation is this new Lion King that comes out next year. And Animation is Into the Spider-Verse, and animation is SpongeBob and Teen Titans Go. It's all those things. So it's really medium, not genre. Let's let's keep working on that for 2019. So also, I read this article by Lawrence Ware and on Slate, and it was titled, I'm Still Waiting for the First Black Spider-Man to Get His Own Movie. Excuse me. So it was like posed that should the first black slash Afro Latin Spider Man have had his own movie instead of being like the lesser than Spider Person? And I understand what people are getting at from this. It's like this is supposed to be his movie. And to to a certain extent there are times when he gets overshadowed either by the group or by Peter B. Parker. And I I understand what they mean that this should have just been Miles, his coming of age story, and really him being the Spider Man. However, I don't, I still don't feel like he was that overshadowed. Not that this writer and people that share his sentiments are wrong. I feel like he still held his own, whether the other characters were in the scene or he was in the scene by himself. That I, I just, I don't know. Me, I understand maybe there just shouldn't have been so many, but I don't feel like I did not get enough like uh miles. Like, I got I don't feel like that at all. I, if anything, I'm just ready for the sequel, you know. So I I feel like I'll post a link for that too. I understand just being bummed out that he had to share his screen, his movie with like four or five other spider people, but it wasn't that bad. Well, we've reached the end of the episode and episode two, and I'm so happy. And I'm so thankful. It took me like, I don't know, it took me so long to build up the the guts, I, I should say, to actually sit down and record it. Like I had all my notes and everything written up, but I was just like couldn't sit down and actually get the episode done. And I'm, I'm happy that it's done. And I'm thankful for all the support I got on the first episode. And I'm looking forward to many 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 more episodes to come as I get more comfortable doing this and I get more comfortable being like a solo host and like all those type of things and I can't wait to wait actually the next episode it is going to be if you remember a few months ago I had a blog post where I sat down with my friend former co-worker Jen Hurler of Animation Complex and I we had like an interview a, a discussion type of thing and it was a blog post However, what you don't know is that I actually recorded our conversation because I knew I wanted to do a podcast. So that post was back in September. You can go and check it out while you wait for our interview to come out in January. So I'm just going to preface this by saying I recorded the episode before I actually figured out how I was going to format the show so it's a little bit unstructured structured and I just hope it doesn't sound jarring to you guys but I'm really excited for y'all to hear the conversation one because Jen is amazing two because Jen has an amazing mind as well like hey Jen (laughs) and I think you guys are really gonna enjoy the conversation and also what's coming up in the next that'll be predominantly it in that episode um it's gonna be formatted a little differently because we did speak for almost an hour and I don't want a super long episode. So with that being said, thank you again for listening, for supporting, for resharing the show and everything like that. You can find me again on all social media platforms at Simply Robotics. Robotics is spelled R-O-B-O-T-I-X. You can go to simplyrobotics.com, leave reviews on iTunes, on, on the website, on the post. Just let me know when you're listening. So until next time, 
See ya.